I'm Walter Block. I'm Jody Emery. This is Adam Kokesh. I'm Jeffrey Tucker. I'm Ben Swan. I'm Tom Woods. I'm Peter Schiff. I'm Eric Voorhees. And you're listening to... And you're listening... And you're listening... You're listening... You're listening to... Ed and Ethan. Soak up the awesomeness. You are listening to Ed and Ethan, the voice of liberty in Canada, coming to you from Saskatoon, the province of Saskatchewan. That's from Kadakistan, eh? My incredible and amazing intrepid co-host, Ed, he's not here today. Because, I don't know, he's like fishing or something in the mountains and woods of British Columbia. I have no idea why he'd want to do that and not be here. But to answer that question, perhaps, my intrepid co-host now is Andrew Bassett. So welcome Hello. back. Hello. Yeah, it's good wow. to have you back. Boy, it's so nice to be here. So comfortable, too. Well, yeah, it, listeners will know that Andrew was filling in, a, well, became our third chair for uh, for an episode. It was two weeks ago. Yeah. Well, you know. Check just, that show out if you haven't listened to it already. It's really good. <laughs> it says the unbiased source. I like it. Uh, no, I, I guess uh, it's going to be good to have you here uh, filling in as co-host and uh, I don't know. I just like having you in the studio. Do you feel like you've got more gravitas now being promoted from third chair? I don't know what chair? that word is. I was unschooled. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right. I forgot. I'm sorry. Andrew, do you like... <laughs> no, okay. So, yeah, yeah. Just Can you talk like 20 words a minute? <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, says the applications <laughs> analyst who works at IBM. Okay, uh, you're listening. To, <laughs> I'm, of course, your humble host, Ethan. You're listening to us on dailypaulradio.com, as well as Liberty Express, LRN, FBRN, VVN, and so on and so forth. I'm sure I missed a couple there, but whatever. It's all good. You're hearing us there, so you'll know exactly what I missed, right? Mm. Makes sense. Um, we're going to talk to Turd Meester uh, in the second half of the show. Uh, Tur de Meester is a great little economist from uh, Belgium, got an accent and a wit to match mm. his cool accent. You know, he's, he's smart, is what I'm trying to say. Does it make yeah. sense? Yeah. yeah, that's what makes him so nice and uh, interesting, <laughs> I well, guess. Yeah, we're going to talk to him about uh, schooling, about because, uh, you know, Andrew, having you here being an unschooled fellow, it makes a lot of sense. And we'll get into Bitcoin, too, and all that good stuff, you know, given the time. Um, in the meantime, though, let's start the show off with something that I read from Wikipedia. And it's it's interesting because I like how this kind of contrasts with the perspective that we have of police today. From the article Pelian Principles, by the way, the origin of the concept of modern policing, the second paragraph of the article reads as follows. In the British model of policing, police officers are citizens in uniform. They exercise their powers to police their fellow citizens with the implicit consent of their fellow citizens. Policing by consent is the phrase used to describe this. It denotes that the legitimacy of policing in the eyes of the public is based upon a general consensus of support that follows from transparency about their powers, demonstrating integrity in exercising those powers and their accountability for doing so. Yeah, I haven't even heard about this till just now, and I'll bet you that my reaction to this is similar to most people's reaction to this, which is, how could something like this possibly work? <laughs> well, it doesn't seem to be how modern policing uh, exists, It does it? I don't think of police as generally mm. very accountable. I don't think of them as very trustworthy. Well, and, you know, I, that's me. I get the impression that this isn't uh, something that's practiced a whole lot right now. Is this kind of an older uh, system? Yeah, this is what was it from the 1820s. Uh, this is okay. kind of where the concept of modern policing was come up with. Um, but it, it's it's the idea was, and you know, continues to purportedly be that you have these police officers with powers, and 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 what keeps them uh, desirable is that they are accountable. So they use these powers for the communal good, right? Everybody gives their quote unquote implicit consent because they know that police are of a benefit. What I am not so sure of today is whether or not police are of a benefit. I don't, you know, look, I, I, I guess I'm one of those anti-police nut jobs, right? I don't think that police generally make for a peaceful community. Yeah, you mean, you mean they don't provide a net benefit? That's right. I Look, there's when, when you're uh, being faced with an imminent threat of violence, I think that police are probably who you're going to call first, yep. right, typically. But I also think that really you don't have any other choices. Uh, there are some pretty neat sort of uh, anarchist developments that are, uh, I think Peacekeeper is an application mm -hmm. 
uh, that's already available on the iPhone. They're developing it for Android. Um, and that allows you to kind of source defense from the community, right? right? Emergency services, in fact, not just defense. Um, but look, police are sort of what we're familiar with, right? Mm -hmm. But police are also expected to enforce the dictates of government. And if you have a government that is dysfunctional, distrustworthy, or not trustworthy, uh, I mean, look, how many people out there really trust politicians to be ethical and you know have 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 some sort of sensible sort of uh, uh, manner of, of arriving at uh, the development of public policy? I don't think many people really have a lot of faith in politicians, and yet we're told well, police. They have to enforce their dictates. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Uh, I mean, and I don't even know how they keep up with all these new laws that, that go into effect. Every day, it seems like. Mm. Yeah, well, but I don't think they do. No. <laughs> you, look at, you look at how uh, people interact with police, and, and there is so much fogginess on the law. Police usually depend on, on some very kind of common uh, cornerstones, so, you know, they know you can be arrested for resisting arrest, for mm -hmm. instance, right? These are these, you know, very basic charges, and, and they can have some sort of uh, uh, understanding of nuances of law, but generally, you know, it, the police are kind of in the dark just as citizens are about just what is the law today. I mean, even lawyers who spend their, their whole career studying it can't, can't figure it all out. That's, that's true. So. But it, Again, the reason I was I was inspired to look at this is because uh, I watched a video that's kind of going around on Facebook and other social media right now. Um, it's about a guy who uh, he gets a phone call from from animal control and they tell him that uh, a police officer has shot his dog in the head. Yeah. Uh, so while he's away at work, um, his dog is in a fenced off yard. Uh, the excuse given is that police were searching for a missing child. Uh -huh. Um, so they open the gate to his backyard, go in and, and I guess they shoot this dog. Um, and he's very upset by that, obviously. Right. You know, um, but I, I this kind of, to me was an example of, of where police kind of needlessly inject violence into a community in this guy's case. You know, it, it you know his best friend. He actually refers to it in the video uh, as, as being considered like his child uh, has been blown away mm. by the police. That's pretty harsh to deal with, hey? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you see these stories all the time, and I, I'm part of me kind of wants to say you you can sort of understand police if they're entering someone's home and and they don't know uh, how dangerous a dog is. I, mm. I don't feel good about it. And I I don't I can't see I agree with it, but I mean, I mean you you kind of understand why they do what they do when they when they shoot. These you can dogs. understand the motivation. Yeah, yeah. You you can you can understand the motivation, but I I don't think it's sensible. I mean, you think also too of the searching for a missing child. You know, it's an admirable goal. Doesn't mean you can stomp on people's rights to do it, right? Mm. And this guy's yeah. private property is his private property. Um. You know, I, I kind of I, I like there. There's that uh, doormat that you can buy online. It come back with a warrant. <laughs> I like that doormat, <laughs> yeah. but it, it it speaks to a, a broader principle, right? Which is your your home is kind of your castle, or at least it's supposed to be. Um, and if police are out there searching for a missing child, look, admirable goal, but you still have rights, don't you? Um, so in this case, not only were the guy's rights trampled on, but then his and and I know animal rights activists hate. <laughs> when I when I say stuff like this, but then his property was destroyed, um, and yeah. I I think look, it, it, dogs are you know they have uh, personality, empathy, and emotion, um, but they are essentially property. Well, I mean, I I'm, not, I'm not trying to I'm not trying I, to be unsympathetic. I, no, no right? I, I agree with you. I'd be just as upset if someone's robot was. Was, was shot. <laughs> well, well, if it was an empathetic robot with a personality, right? Oh, I mean, if um, he was a threatening-looking robot, then... <laughs> I, I, but it, it, it's, it seems to me that this was of a net loss to the community, and nothing positive was done there, right? I don't see what. No, it, it, I mean, I, I think situations like these are are unfortunate, but I mean, there's also, um, I don't, I don't really agree with. Uh, their willingness to go into people's homes, and they're pretty. I, know, I think I think that we have a system where police officers are trained to shoot dogs on sight, pretty much. 
I think you, yeah, I think I'd agree with that. And more and more, it seems like police officers defer to eliminate, you know, uh, terminating an animal's life because it might be threatening. And in many cases, these animals are running away. Uh, yeah. They're cowering in fear. Uh, perhaps they're wagging their tail. That's been caught on video, smiling. I, you know, yeah. So. So that there's definitely something wrong here. And again, when we look at these Pelian principles, it's talking about how the community gives implicit consent because the integrity being demonstrated by police is what gives them their powers. I think there's a lot of cause right now in North America, especially in the United States, to consider that perhaps that integrity is no longer being displayed and, and those powers are no longer deserved. Uh, but uh, to- well, no. I mean, I don't think we. I don't think we. We can say that our police forces have integrity, and I don't think we even really expect it all that much anymore. And I don't think we mm. live in a society with Pelian. What is it called? Pelian principles. Pelian principles. Yes. Yeah. Well, I. We can also. I want to move on to the next story, but I, I think there's also a discussion there we have from time to time on the show about you know just why the concept of the modern the concept of modern policing to begin with is flawed. It's just not economically viable as a system. Well, like you say, I mean, you, if you're in danger, you call nine one one, and they're and they, and people are told that's what you do when you when someone's threatening you. Um, that's kind of like saying that uh, if you're hungry, you order a pizza. <laughs> you can't cook your own food. I don't know. It, it's 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 a, it's a centralized system, and there there are problems with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let's check out this uh, this case of innovation because okay, when it comes to vehicles, I love all sorts of neat technologies that come up and yeah. are are, are uh, come up with. This one's great. Hyundai has revealed a new feature of its smart Genesis car. Uh, <laughs> it slows the car down automatically uh, in speed camera traps. How does it even do that? I'm pretty sure what it does is that it maps out existing traps. So mm. it, it kind of it, it tries to keep as up to date with information as it possibly can. I right. don't know specifically if it uses an Internet connection to do that. Sure. I mean, the maps, they, they, they know all the roads now. They have them mm. on the maps. They I guess they can also know the speed limits, too. Right. Well, there are established kind of speed traps, right, where you have these right. just radar cameras that are perched permanently in a location. And all they do is look for camera or all <laughs> they do is look for cars that are speeding. Right. So this car what it'll do first it'll beep at you saying hey you know a speed trap coming up Hmm. and then it'll slow you down automatically i don't know if you can disable the feature or whatever um but i think that's pretty cool but a lot of people are looking at this car saying oh it's a car that left you know specifically engineered for the break right why why are we allowing this yeah Yeah, right oh never mind i like cars are built to far exceed yeah. speed limits that we have too. Well, I think no. If, <laughs> if if people out there are willing to speed, we need to we need to make sure we capture them and throw them in jail, right? Oh, to get yeah. them off the streets. We don't need cars like this. Speeder, <laughs> yeah. rape cage. No, I, it, it's 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 pretty. Uh, I I think one of the well, okay. Think of one of the justifications you hear for uh, police setting up speed traps: the safety, right? Right. It's, it's safety. Exactly. And and and. I don't know if they still say it now, but I have heard many times in the past where, you know, police are talking about how, oh, we don't mind if it goes out on the radio and on TV that there's a speed trap mm. somewhere, you know, in traffic news or what Because we're, we're, our end goal is to have people slow down. Well, except that's safe. not really true because, yeah. because um, <laughs> I, I'm sure I've heard of this before where someone will, will set up a, will, will go back and set up a <laughs> sign by the side of the road saying speed trap. Yeah, and then they'll get they'll get in trouble for doing that, right? That's right. In fact, actually, that that even happened in respect to bicycles in Quebec. Hmm. Somebody warning cyclists got a ticket from police yeah. uh, for obstruction of justice. It was crazy, yeah. and all they were telling them was, you know, there are police up ahead looking to see if you stop. Yeah, at this you're red basically light. saying, uh, basically advocating that you follow the law, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's but that's that's not legal, right? <laughs> well, yeah, that that really speaks to the real motivations at work, which is revenue generation. I, I mean, yeah, and catching people well, breaking these these laws that they are set up to break. Well, I mean, here's the thing: if they're really concerned about getting people to slow down, why don't they just put up fake uh, warnings everywhere saying "speed trap ahead"? <laughs> <laughs> they could do that, <laughs> or why not just um, I I don't know. Look, the the the, the the focus really should be on insurance 
and, and and how expensive it is to insure yourself depending on your driving habits, right? Like all of these all of these things like speed and uh, speed traps and such. They're supposed to be deterrents. They're actually about revenue generation. But even if they were about deterrents, it's not really a deterrent, is it? I mean, people still speed and people still... That's true. I mean, it's still not really very risky to speed in certain places. Sure. Well, I remember uh, coming home recently, driving this long stretch of road, the the speed limit 60 kilometers per hour... Yes, I'm sorry, Americans. You're gonna have to convert. <laughs> but I, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm I'm driving down this road slowly, and there's nobody in front of me, nobody in the other lane. Even if there was, there's a divider, a cement divider between the lanes. I just kind of got to go. And you know what? Mm. You know the reason I don't speed there is because I know police stake that spot out yeah. every so often. I know they do. It's because of revenue. They can, they know they can catch speeders there because there's no yeah. reason you wouldn't speed. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. I hate that. I just hate that. So I'm, I'm happy that, uh, you know, some features are being innovated to uh, release people from the bondage of nonsense laws hmm. traffic laws i'm happy no. about that um there's there's this great story from the calgary herald a calgary doctor refuses to prescribe birth control over moral beliefs a doctor at a walk-in clinic in southwest calgary is refusing to prescribe birth control due to her personal beliefs Chantelle Berry of West Glen Medical Center does not prescribe contraception. A sign at the facility's front desk reads, The physician on duty today will not prescribe the birth control pill. Hmm. Hmm. So well, if I don't have a problem with people being against contraception. I mean, this is really simple. Why don't you get a job that doesn't involve... Uh, handing a, uh, selling people <laughs> contraception. Okay, so so are you saying that this doctor, uh, she should be compelled so long as she wishes to remain employed, she should be compelled to hand out birth control? Well, what if my religion said that I uh, I can't use any electronic device on Fridays? Mm. Should I say should they uh, should they let me take a day off every week? Okay. Well, consider here that her employer is the clinic. Not well. It kind of is also the healthcare mm. system that we have in Canada, right? The overbearing behemoth, tentacly beast it is. Um, but I mean, if her employer, the clinic, is okay with it, why is her employer okay with it? That that's what I want to know. I don't know. I mean, it could be any number of reasons, right? It boils down to personal preference, doesn't it? Because, I mean, look, here's the thing, right? A doctor is receiving voluntary interaction from patients. Patients go to the doctor to get service, right? Mm -hmm. So in my mind, and and the fact that we have a a socialized healthcare system in Canada um, is is, is a complication. Yeah, that's kind of a little bit part of it. Yeah, it is. It does make it a little bit more murky. But in a private system, in a system of of free enterprise, where you had somebody just offering their services as a doctor to the community at large and saying, by the way, I don't give out birth control. I don't really see a problem with that. I mean, I I think it's kind of I think it's kind of stupid. Oh, (laughs) but 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 in that case. Okay, their religious beliefs are basically a personal preference, isn't it? So they just don't want to be compelled to give somebody a service. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. So I don't see anything wrong in that context. But in this case, I guess it does get more complicated because of a socialized system. And in in a socialized system, you have this uh, sharing of risk and benefit. Mm. So you would want to be able to go to a doctor and say... Look, you work for the government, and the government's supposed to be my insurer, basically, so yep. shouldn't you be giving out this service? I actually think that's reasonable. Yeah, no, I think if if we're talking strictly about government employees here, they should be required to do their job. End of story. Yeah, I. but that's the thing, right? Yeah. That's, that's so oppressive and terrible because of government. Again, you know, <laughs> you boil it down. What's the problem here is the okay, state. Okay, I mean, well, okay, let's say you didn't have uh, state involvement at all in this. And yeah, you'd have certain clinics that would prescribe uh, uh, birth control, others that wouldn't, and mm-hmm. there wouldn't be a problem. That's it. You, you don't prescribe birth control, then you don't get the profit incentive yep. that those customers who would like birth and control offer. It would be their offer. loss. Yeah, I, yeah. Th- it's it's odd, you know. You, you look at this stuff, and it seems like you, people get so fired up about it, right? It's so worked up, you know. 
you have people, you need birth control, you need to promote sexual health and, and reproductive health and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's so, it's made so simple. If you just take government out of the picture, then you just have this plethora of options and choices. That's, mm. uh, all right. Um, well, let's also try to get to this because I love the Uber and Lyft uh, issues. Uh, okay, we've talked about Uber and Lyft on the show before, and so for those unfamiliar, Uber and Lyft, and I think there's another one, uh, Sidecar, I think, um, they basically just, they just have an application on your smartphone. You can sub or, uh, summon an Uber or Lyft car, right? And they compete directly with taxis. So there was a hmm. big protest in Washington, D.C., uh, taxi drivers everywhere, uh, ironically jamming up traffic. <laughs> So is this kind of like a carpooling app that lets people give rides to each other? Not quite. You actually have to sign up with Uber to become an approved driver mm. to meet their standards. Uh, and basically, yeah, somebody can just summon you with a mobile app okay, and you well, can be a taxi. So are there any requirements to be the driver of the of the so-called taxi or is it? Yeah, uh, uh, there's the, well, which of the taxi service or, or the Uber service? Uber. Okay. So for Uber, yeah, like they're, they're, I, I'm not sure specifically what their requirements are, but it's kind of like, they're kind of like a, kind of like an employer, except they're mm. more like an employment agency almost. They hand out, you know, they give you access to the app as a driver. Um, but yeah, Uber and Lyft and Sidecar, these services, uh, they are basically just free market enterprise. They develop their own standards for who can drive mm. with them. Um, some of their luxury car services uh, that you need to have a nice, you know, Lincoln Town car or something, yeah. right? But it sounds like they're what are they? They're undercutting their competition. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the taxi unions don't like this at all, mm. and they, you know, they rather than compete. And by the way, some of the arguments here are just ludicrous, like. Uh, Uber should be charging. They should up their rates. <laughs> so it's a good then charge what taxi services charge, hmm. right? And what do they care if Uber's <laughs> making more money or not? Well, so, some Uber services are more expensive. Like uh, I think Uber, no, Uber X is the cheap one. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. um, the point is they're being competitive, right? They're yeah. competing with taxi services and taxi services just don't want the competition. They would rather have government shut it down. So, well, they're, look, Uber's dragging down the wages of, <laughs> of, uh, of their, uh, their community, right? It, that's how it's perceived. Yeah, that's totally how it's perceived. It's not. You know, it's not that these taxi drivers are charging too much or whatever. I mean, look, just bloody will compete. Yeah, that's the nature of competition. Is you get this better service. That's how it works, right? Somebody comes up with a better service, a more efficient way of delivering that service than you have for cheaper. Right. That's how the market works. You're not entitled to your customers. You're not entitled to your position yeah. in the market as the provider of a service. Yeah. That's it. You just aren't entitled to it. So for these taxi drivers and these taxi unions that are so upset and pissed off, too bad. That's... You, I, like, oh. <laughs> I well, get so I'll upset you, about this. But I mean, even more to that is the point that I'll bet you that these people, these Uber drivers, are probably just as much a part of the, their communities... I mean, th th we're not talking about uh, foreigners coming in and doing this. Yeah, I would think it's probably it's I, probably uh, even if even if we were, who cares? Yeah, I mean, it's, I yeah. want to ride from somebody just because you have a taxi license doesn't mean you get to be the first one to offer yeah. it to me. I mean, I know that's how government works, but that shouldn't be it. Um, we're going to be back after the break. We're going to talk to Turdam Easter uh, about, you know, the, the, the Belgium economist mm. guy. He's cool to talk to. Um, yeah, and I hope you're having fun, Andrew. Are you having fun? Oh, I'm chugging right along here. <laughs> Good stuff. All right, we'll be back right after the music, after these valuable messages and all that stuff. Uh, continue listening right here on dailypaulradio.com. This is Ed and Ethan. you're tired of all the useless background chatter from the mainstream media. It's no wonder they struggle as much as they do, despite all the resources they're given, but that's why we're here. Be sure to visit us at edandethan.com to check out our newest updates, and while you're there, hit the donate button to help us further develop our product for your benefit. If you're a Bitcoin fan, look for our Bitcoin wallet address on the edandethan.com homepage and throw us some Satoshis. Of course, you could always just stick with the status quo. The government's just great because it's got all the answers. 
you sick of waiting for government and politics to change? Quit waiting. Take control of your life and find your freedom now with The Stateless Man. This is your host and editor of thestatelessman.com, Fergus Hodgson. I'm an expat from New Zealand who's also lived in the United States, Canada, and Ecuador. My quest is to find freedom for my own life and for the lives of others. Each week I explore how to achieve that through personal initiative and voting with your feet beyond arbitrary borders. Be sure to check out the Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash The Stateless Man and follow me on Twitter at The Stateless Man. And all of those great messages being as valuable as they are, uh, depending on what stream you're on. All right. We're back, or at least I am. I'm alone. You know why? Because I just did the worst possible thing. Well, you know, the worst possible thing happened that can happen to anybody editing the program. We had finished everything. Everything had been finished. Uh, we had this great interview with Turtle Meester recorded. That's what you'd be listening to right now, except it all got eaten. Eaten by, uh, by I don't know, the computer beast, the demon that lives within. Oh, God, I can't believe it's all been lost. So all you have is me. Even Andrew's already gone. Andrew had the, all this great stuff, great questions for Tur. Uh, great questions on Bitcoin, all of it. We got some great insight there. It's all gone. You're never going to hear it. I'm never going to hear it. I was editing pieces of it. That's all I got. All I have now is the memory of the greatness that was this interview with Turtemeister now finally or suddenly left in the lurch. So I just, I guess I'm going to go over some news stories. You know, I'll do what I was doing with Andrew moments ago in your perceived timeline. <laughs> I can't believe it. Hours of work all gone, but that's okay. It's all right. You know what? Still above ground, still breathing. It's a darn good day. That's my standard. I try to stick to. So we'll continue with it. No after show today because uh, because, well, I hope it's obvious. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, we'll go into some more news stories. I have this great, this, I was going to leave this as a kicker, actually. Uh, we just didn't get to it in the first half. Uh, so we we're going to push into the after show, but here you get it now. A Saskatoon defense lawyer says it's good. The government is concerned about drunk drivers. This is right here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Uh, from CBC News, suspending drivers' license until trial dead wrong, says a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when it, uh, But it's dead wrong when it comes to a recent change dealing with license suspensions. Until recently, when someone pulled over and blew a 08, it would mean a 24-hour suspension extended to 90 days after Saskatchewan government insurance is notified. So basically a 24-hour suspension that is actually 90 days. Uh, Saskatchewan Government Insurance is the only insurer of automobiles in the province. We have our glorious government uh, telling us exactly how to insure our vehicles. You know, they've got our best interest at heart. It's, it's how it works, right? It makes sense, right? Um, so uh, it's kind of weird uh, for blowing uh, 08 or over the limit, you know, drunk driving. You do get that 90-day suspension right off the hop. However, as of Friday, June 27th, the article continues, the license suspension stays in effect until the driver's case is resolved in court. Saskatoon lawyer Mark Braford, who handles a lot of impaired driving cases, says that's a problem. There is one glitch where they're punishing potentially innocent people for wanting to be able to have a trial, and that's one amendment that I think is philosophically dead wrong, he said. Immediate license suspension up to court disposition is something that will likely be challenged in court as a violation of people's constitutional rights. It destroys the presumption of innocence, he said. If you want to have a trial, they're going to take your license away, and presently we only take someone's license away pending trial if they're likely dangerous. The new license suspension rules are part of a slew of changes to traffic safety rules that SGI says are designed to save lives. Also starting Friday, if police find a driver... In fact, it's already started. Find a driver with a blood alcohol content below the legal limit, but above 0.04%, the driver's license will be suspended for a minimum of three days. This is pretty crazy. Uh, you know, look, what this boils down to 
is that if you do get uh, into a situation where you are in violation of the law in respect to how much alcohol you've consumed uh, before driving a vehicle, uh, your license is essentially just taken away and can be taken away for however long it takes for you to get a trial. That can be a long time. I mean, I know in Canada and the United States, we get these guarantees to fast, speedy, efficient justice. When does that actually happen? I, well, fast and speedy, my patoot. I, honestly, uh, that doesn't happen. The, the court systems are clogged, uh, over, uh, overclogged with, with nonsense cases, a uh, result of the drug war, a uh, result of uh, petty, vindictive, moral judgments given the power of law, uh, you don't get speedy justice. So now they get this situation where, well, somebody's license get taken away. It uh, gets taken away for an inordinate amount of time. Yeah, that can have a serious impact on somebody's life because, you know, you need a license to drive a motor vehicle, apparently. I don't think, okay, look, even though, uh, or even with the consideration that, uh, I don't think you should have a license to drive, it doesn't matter. I don't think licenses should be de determinant in, in whether or not you can drive. Um, but even when it comes to the drunk driving thing, look, we go about that all wrong. We're trying to basically say, look, this is what's right for everybody. We're going to create a rule that we believe will make safer streets and impose that rule, uh, enforce it with violence. We've talked about this before. You know, this boils down to insurance. It's simple, just insurance. Are you a risk on the road? Insurance will tell you. Insurance will look statistically at your demographic, at anything else that you maybe your particular work life is a, a, a statistical indicator of, of insurable risk. All of that, it's just all you do. Like, a lot of common objection to this approach that, you know, uh, drinking and driving should be completely illegal or should be completely legal and that insurance should be the prevailing uh, determiner of, of, of how you cost that sort of risk of driving drunk. Uh, a common uh, problem with this is, look, uh, you can't insure, uh, you know, you look, a brand new driver, uh, they don't have a driving record yet. How are you going to insure those people? Uh, how, how are you? Gonna, well, I already mentioned it. And, and, and insurance companies already do this. They look at demographics. They look at statistics. What is, when we take a large enough aggregate sample from the population, what is the chance that somebody like you, in general terms, we're going to generalize, what is the chance that somebody like you will cause an accident? And from there, once you do develop a history, well, we can apply discounts. We can get more specific we can start to negotiate specific insurance packages for somebody more like you, for you in particular. That's how insurance works. You look at statistics. You analyze likelihoods. It's really simple. You don't have to have uh, police uh, trawling around and uh, looking for people who might be uh, uh, a little woozy or whatever. You don't have to have that. It's just insurance. That's all it is. That's all it boils down to. Uh, instead of having... Uh, giving police uh, one more excuse for, uh, you know, fishing about in your vehicle uh, for whatever other criminal act they think is going on. Um, so, yeah, uh, just a chance to talk about that. There is a court ruling in Quebec, Canada's most populous province, a nation within a nation, uh, the La Belle Provence. Uh, you'll know it as uh, Canada's French-speaking province. Uh, Quebec is also kind of like California almost, although I guess Quebec and Ontario, they compete for, no, uh, Quebec is not Canada's most populous province. That's Ontario. Quebec has about 25% of the country's population. However, Walmart Canada corporation broke Quebec's labor laws when it shut a store in Jean Care almost a decade ago, just after its employees organized a union, the Supreme court of Canada's ruled in a 5-2 to two decision authored by Mr. Justice Louis Lebel, a former Quebec labor lawyer, the court said Walmart violated a section of the Quebec Labor Code that says an employer can't change its workers' conditions of employment without the union's consent, while a first collective agreement is being negotiated. 
Closing the store and canceling contracts amounted to an illegal change of working conditions, it said. Uh, for those familiar with the story, this is nearly a decade old, uh, this issue. Uh, Walmart faced uh, being unionized. One of its stores in Canada <clears throat> uh, was to be unionized. The workers there had decided to uh, begin the process uh, after some time of negotiation. And it was said that Walmart was negotiating in bad faith. Uh, I honestly can't remember if that was the case or not. It wouldn't surprise me. They certainly didn't want to be unionized. Uh, they shut down their store. Uh, the store was um, performing well. It was profiting, uh, as far as I remember. Um, an arbitrator, uh, after after they shut their store down, uh, everything went to arbitration. An arbitrator said, look, Walmart had no good reason to shut this store down because it was profitable. It wasn't reasonable. Um, but really, I don't think that's the arbitrator's. I don't think an arbitrator can make that sort of a judgment, at least not one that is enforced by force. Uh, Walmart, look, from Walmart's perspective, there may have been other reasons to shut the store. Perhaps uh, the threat of unionizing the one Walmart store posed uh, the possibility of unionizing all of Walmart star stores, which would have had absolutely a large impact. On their business. Now, I'd call the reaction in such a case rather reasonable that they wish to discourage unionizing in their stores. And they go, okay, so that sounds like union busting. All right. Well, continue to consider uh, the principles of a free market in that anybody can compete as they desire. If you are being abused as an employee, get this. Here, here's, here's where this comes down. Now let's say you are an employee and you feel that your employer is profiting inordinately off of the back of your labor. You, uh, providing uh, labor capital, feel that you're just not getting your fair share, whatever fair is to you. There's a pretty simplistic solution to this. You could start your own Walmart. You could start your own store. Look, if there's such a great uh, gouging going on, if, 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 you're, if you're making so very little while well, Walmart's making so very much and you are being exploited, doesn't that just mean that there's a profit incentive for you? Doesn't that mean that somebody else could come in and, let's say, make half the profit that Walmart is making with the same business model and offer you uh, an increased wage? Isn't that isn't that what's going on here? You, you, something's wrong in respect to competition. What could it be? What could be getting in the way of businesses competing efficiently with Walmart? Hmm. That's an odd question, isn't it? Well, it might have something to do with government. I, you know, that's just me spitballing, though. Workers bought several legal actions against Walmart, but the company won most of them, including a 2009 decision of the Supreme Court that said the employees had used the wrong labor law provisions to fight the company's actions. Workers brought, uh, In a statement Friday, Walmart Canada said it was disappointed by the latest decision. This was an appeal of a unanimous decision by the Quebec Court of Appeal to reject the UFCW's claim, which in our view was a legally correct decision. We will review the decision carefully in order to determine what our next steps will be, the company said. By the way, the UFCW, United Food and Commercial Workers Union, uh, has always struck me as a dues generator. Uh, basically, the union exists in order to make sure that the union exists, kind of perpetuate its own existence. Uh, UFCW typically unionizes uh, low-skill jobs, entry-level jobs, um, you know, ones that don't pay very well. The dues are not excessive because the people just aren't being paid a whole lot. Um, so, it seems, I don't know, it, it just seems to me like UFCW is generally very underpowered. They're a huge union, but when it comes to protecting the individual worker, they seem to offer limited resources. They're mainly just kind of an obstructionist organization that makes it difficult for the employer to 
uh, to I perhaps uh, perhaps be sadistically pun- uh, punitive towards employees, I suppose. Maybe that could be said. But, but it just seems like a slow-moving moving behemoth. I've never had any sort of warm spot in my heart for the USCW. Uh, another story, the city of Vancouver formally declares city is on unceded Aboriginal territory, which is pretty interesting. Vancouver City Council has unanimously voted to acknowledge that the city is on unceded ad- Aboriginal territory. Mayor Greg- Gregor Robertson declared a year of reconciliation last summer in the hopes of building a uh, new relationships between Aboriginals and Vancouverites. Uh, quote, underlying all other truths sp- spoken during the Year of Reconciliation is the truth that the modern city of Vancouver was founded on the traditional territories of First Nations and that these territories were never ceded through treaty, war, or surrender. Um, and this is part of a motion from the city. Uh, now, I don't know if that's actually true. I'm certainly not a treaty expert. Uh, I don't know uh, specifically the history of wars uh, with uh, the native bands there uh, and European armies or colonialist armies. I'm not really sure. But, but look, the reason that this story interests me is not even necessarily because Vancouver City Council has essentially said that the whole city belongs to native bands, which is interesting. I don't know if the federal government would have to uh, agree with that in order to prefer it to be valid and legitimate under a color of law. But What's interesting to me about this story is that it's just governments playing government. I tend to think of government as, uh, well, it doesn't change if the ethnic group changes, right? So uh, in the case of Aboriginal government, it seems as ridiculous a thing to me as European government, if you want to call it that. But there was something... Andrew and I were talking about this off air, and it's really too bad he's not here. I'm going to have to take a baseball bat to Ed's computer or something. Anyway, we were talking about this off air, and Andrew kind of posited the question, what, what on earth goes on? Like, why don't other governments do this and some governments do? Why, why do, you know, when you invade, uh, when when some country invades another country and kills its government, um, the other government doesn't usually come back and, you know, rise up and revolutionize or be a revolutionary government. And, you know, given enough time, it kind of fades away, the concept, right? You get this this sort of, uh, you know, country A invades country B, country B resents it for a little while, but eventually they just become part of country A and everything's all cool. They morph into it, right? Um So why doesn't that happen with Aboriginal government? And I think that the reason for that is because of ethnic uh, definitions. Rather than split people into, you know, power structures, we split them into uh, ethnic groups. We identify uh, native government as native government. Listeners of the show would probably remember that I've mentioned, for me, as, you know, one of God's chosen people... (laughs) It doesn't make any sense to me that I should have any love for Israel, right? Like, I'm, I am told sometimes that uh, I should go back to Israel, go back, I've never been. I should go to Israel, I should, I should accept some of the free land that they give settlers, right, or whatever, or I should accept a house and payments. I, I should go there for some reason, but I have no idea why unless it's to do with ethnic identity. Uh and as an ethnic sort of religious uh, group, Jews are encouraged to be identified as such. You know, we need to take on that identity. Uh, Israel, it's a Jewish nation, right? It's supposed to be something that you find a connection to, a, a spiritual connection, not just a, you know, a connection of heritage and whatnot. It's, it's actually supposed to be deeper than that. I've never understood that. I've never gotten that. And I've never looked at that and said, yeah, that makes sense. I've always looked at that and said, there is no logic in that. Why would I ever feel any sort of a connection to Israel? And it would make sense if I were devout and religious, I suppose. It might make sense that I would have to be part of a movement to keep my people's traditions alive. And when I look at Aboriginal government in Canada, 
I see the same sort of nonsense. And I know some people probably get pretty offended by that. I, I, I look, if you want to uh, preserve your traditions, fine. Okay. If your traditions are Aboriginal traditions, fine. Okay. If there is a history to be talked about here of how land was stolen, Okay, let's talk about that. I get it. I, there, there, it I'm not trying to dismiss important issues uh, of, of how uh, segments of society have been marginalized and abused. But I think that what has really caused that is embracing these ethnic identities and separating ourselves, thinking that some humans are different sorts of humans than others. Um, part of the uh, abandonment of tradition amongst uh, Aboriginal communities in Canada seems to often be referred to as colonialism. Uh, people uh, exerting their influence over Aboriginal communities to have them forget their ways and think of them as less sort of uh, uh, less important. And that's another thing I've never quite understood is, look, uh, I'm not trying to say that people should be made to forget their Aboriginal uh, roots and traditions. I just don't think that if you look, if if an Aboriginal person says, you know what, I'd rather go out and get a nine to five job and uh, have a cable subscription and uh, kick back on the couch and drink for a while. I mean, if if that's more valuable to them, um, frankly, I, I don't you know, I think there's probably a lot lacking in that scenario, but I'm trying to be simplistic. If it's not forced on them, I don't see anything wrong with it on an ethical basis. I, I, I think it might be sad if some of those traditions are lost. Depends on the traditions. If the traditions are about subjugation, then bad. If the traditions are about, uh, you know, learning and, and bettering oneself somehow, then, you know, those traditions are probably worth preserving somehow. But to say that those traditions are lost because uh, of outside influences that, uh, I guess, convince Aboriginals to leave their traditions behind. Uh, I think that's just kind of how people interact culturally. It doesn't matter if you're Aboriginal, European, or something else. If you see value in another way of living life, then I think that's kind of just part of the human condition. I don't see a problem with that. Uh, so, I don't know. That's just kind of my take on it. Uh let me find a kicker here. You know, I mean, there's so many different stories. Andrew actually brought this one up. This is great. Uh, Quebec police capture three inmates escaped in helicopter jailbreak. <laughs> they were found hiding out in an upscale condominium in Montreal's Old Park District. Three inmates who escaped a jail near Quebec City by helicopter <laughs> uh, have been arrested at a condominium in Old Montreal, Quebec Provincial Police say. Yves Denis, Denis Le Febre, and... Uh, Serge Pomelo, I probably butchered all of those, escaped from Orensfeld Detention Center on June 7th, fleeing westbound in a green helicopter that landed in the jail yard. Uh, the three were arrested at 1.30 a.m. The Sûreté du Québec tweeted the uh, SQ accompanied by an emergency response team apprehended the men. Um, I guess uh, Andrew's take on this was kind of interesting in that he said, uh, this is... They they got an extra sort of punishment tacked onto their sentence, uh, so they were there or no they're they were awaiting trial I think for their uh, alleged crimes, but they uh, they got an extra uh, bit of uh, stuff tacked on because they tried to escape prison right, and in Canada that's illegal, and in the United States I'm pretty sure that's illegal as well right? Don't you get extra time? I I can't remember, um, but anyway, typically you do get extra time tacked onto your sentence if you try to escape. Uh, from prison. And Andrew pointed out in most countries around the world, it seems, I'm not sure if it's most actually, but uh, in many countries around the world, it seems that escape is not illegal because it is basically thought of as human, sort of, it is the human condition to want to be free, right? <laughs> to, to want to escape. So when you're put in prison, uh, governments typically seem to go, well, look, if you try to escape, uh, you know, no hard feelings. We understand you're in a cage and you want to get free. Yeah, it makes sense. I was kind of thinking of that. That's kind of interesting. Uh, and Andrew kind of wondered, why don't we do that here? Why, why isn't that the assumption? And I was thinking, look, you look at a system that is bent on penalizing people for 
uh, doing as they please or, or break, you know, penalizing people for breaking laws that are victimless, you know, crime, uh, doing crimes, engaging criminal acts that are victimless. Um, it's a it's a penalty based system. So you're looking at the system wondering, why is this penalty based system being more penalty oriented? Well, I don't know. I, to me, that just seems kind of flow naturally. You, know, you put somebody in jail for, let's say, smoking cocaine or inject or sniffing. I don't know. Uh, you, for using cocaine, right? You put somebody in jail for that. Uh, it's a victimless crime. You're doing it basically to say, we're going to punish you. We're going to teach you uh, by using violence and punishment. And that's just going to ha- be how it's how it is. So there, you're looking for logic in that. I I, I think that might be a misguided sort of folly. I mean. You know, why? How? You don't find logic in that. It's all penalty based. It kind of, you know, violence flows into more violence. Um, thank you so much for listening today, right here on DailyPaulRadio.com. Uh, stay tuned for more great content. I thank Andrew for all of the help he did give me today, and I'm so sorry to him and also to Tur de Meester for the interview that we had being completely scrapped. It is so terrible a thing. But don't worry, we will connect with them again at some point. We will get that sort of great content for you in the future. In the meantime, we're just going to have to deal with what's come up. It's all good. It was all right, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, stay tuned for more great stuff right here on DailyPaulRadio.com. And thank you so much for listening. This is Ed and Ethan. 